Oftentimes, when people are talking about electrical circuits, they say the word short. Like, oh, this shorted out to that. Or, oh, it's a short, it's a deadbolt short. Shorts actually means a very specific thing. No, no, not that either. I mean, kinda. That one. All right, so I know I'm kind of being a stickler on this, but I think it's really important to understand the language that we use because we're being descriptive of something happening. So a short just means a short circuit, right? It, normally we're supposed to have a circuit with two conductors that go to a load, to some sort of resistance or impedance. If we connect those wires before that resistance or an impedance, it's taking a shortcut through the circuit. So a short just kind of means a shortcut. It means taking the load out of the equation. So most things that happen, most faults as we call them, are shorts. But when you're talking about what is going on in a circuit as an electrician, you need to understand more than just short. We have ground faults. That means that a, there's a short to ground. It's more accurately a fault. So instead of just using the word short all the time, I would use the word fault. And if it's a ground fault, you know there's a problem with ground. If it's an arc fault, you know that there's a arcing problem in the circuit. Or if it's a short, you could say it's a short. But you even go, wanna go more in depth than that. You wanna know, is it a 120 short? Is it a 240 short? Is it two thing too hot or you know ungrounded conductors touching each other? So identifying the different types of shorts is better than just calling them all shorts. But before we get into each one, Let's talk about breakers. Make sure that you stay tuned till the end because at the end of the video, I'm gonna short some stuff out. I'm gonna do some 220 shorts, some short circuits, ground faults, and actually show how they work. Have you ever wondered what's going on inside of breakers? So let's take a look. Inside of here, it looks really complex, but essentially all that's happening is that there's a spring and you can attach to close a circuit or you can open a circuit. So I'm gonna put my fingers on this just so everything doesn't explode at me when I'm doing this. But this is in an off state, right? There's nothing connecting the bus here to the rest of the mechanics inside of this. When we turn it on, it closes. So now current can go through all of this metal and out this back terminal. And then we can shut it off and open it. But what happens when a breaker trips? So let's reset this. We notice that this little orange piece is not in the window. So that trip window actually will signify it. And when a trip happens, this whole thing moves up to show the trip window. So let's trip it. You can see the little orange pops up in the trip window. We reset it. Breakers actually trip by two different methods. There's a thermal trip mechanism inside of here, which is a bimetallic strip. So um, if you have a little bit of overheating, say this 20 amp breaker has like 24 amps on it, and we're just slowly building up too much heat. After a while, this bimetallic strip is actually gonna bend. And that is what causes this whole thing to trip. Then when we have something that's a little bit more catastrophic, like a short circuit, there's gonna be a lot more current flowing through than there would in just a thermal event. So then we have a magnetic event inside of here. So there's the thermal trip mechanism and there's a magnetic trip mechanism. Magnetic trip mechanism is designed at around 200% of whatever the breaker's rating is. So a 20 amp breaker at about 40 amps, it should magnetically separate these leads from each other. So just like that. So that is how breakers work. Did you know that there actually was a point in our history where there was no ground conductor. We just had hots and neutrals or hots and other hots. So the concept of grounding was introduced to very specific pieces of equipment in the 30s and 40s. Took a while for the adoption to actually kind of like carry through the rest of the nation. But that was when the National Electrical Code started to require that we put grounds on things. And it was at first just for specific pieces of equipment. They wanted grounds uh, or a conductor that could carry faults all the way back to a transformer or a generator. So that would carry fault current. And it was a specifically different thing than a short circuit. And then we had grounding electrodes and grounding electrode conductors that were introduced in the 60s. So the same kind of thing. We wanted to make sure that we had a point of reference for the entire electrical system to earth. But they're both very different reasons why they were installed. But this whole idea of shorts or short circuits predated ground faults because grounds were not even a part of electrical systems until the mid 20 first century. Now you know. 
Are you a super nerd electrician like me, where you like reading books and talking about theory and all watching videos and stuff like that? You should become a member of electricianu.com. So membership has a few different benefits. You get all practice exams that we make for free. We've got a residential wireman, a journeyman, and a master. We also have a thing called the Code Cannon, which is 300 questions and it's not timed. It's self-paced, take it as many times as you want. And for all of our members, every single month we put out new premium content, so a lot of videos like this that do not get put on YouTube. They're just private for our members. And then we have courses that we drop every month. So every single month we have some new course. It could be transformers, motors, motor controls, calculations, all kinds of stuff. But they're self-paced, so you can kind of go through them whenever you want. So if you're interested in nerding out like I do, check out the link in the description below where it says membership and come join us. When a short circuit or a ground fault or an arc flash happens, it's a really dangerous situation. There's a couple of reasons why. You can take something, heat it up to a certain amount, and then it changes from solid to liquid. If you have liquid, like water, and you're boiling it, you raise the temperature to 212 degrees, and all of a sudden it starts turning into a vapor. Well, with <laughs> the short circuit, you can actually take solid copper and turn it straight into a vapor. It skips the boiling part and it skips the liquefaction part and turns straight into a vapor. That's kind of nuts. So to get this to happen, you have to have solid copper. You have to heat it up to a certain point. So the boiling point of copper is like 9,985 degrees and it'll start to liquefy. But if you heat it up to an insane amount very quickly, like 4,644 degrees Fahrenheit, it will turn straight from a solid into a gas. So when you short something out, you notice a lot of the copper disappears. It's like, well, where did it just go? It literally turned into vapor and just dissipated in the air. So this is why it's really important when you're working on electrical circuits, don't work live. 95% of the time you don't need to, but there are times where you're gonna have to. Just make sure that you're wearing PPE, wear hot gloves, wear some safety glasses. Klein's got some cool ones that look like snowboarding glasses that you're gonna see here in a minute, but make sure that you're wearing proper PPE in those very rare situations where you actually need to work live. Otherwise, just don't risk it. It's your life. You only get one that we know of. Just don't do it. Be safe out there. So what happens if you're at a supply house and you're trying to get breakers, but you don't know what all the breakers are that they make? Do they make a 46? Do they make a 53? There are standardized breakers in our industry and it helps to know in code at table 240.6a, there's actually a chart of all the standardized circuit breaker sizes. But what happens if you're kind of like in between a size? Can you round up or should you use the one that's smaller? If you use a breaker that's smaller than your load, it might trip all the time. If you use a breaker that's bigger than your load, is that okay? So there's actually another part in code 240.4b and c that talk about being able to round up to the next breaker size if you're up to 800 amps. But once you get over 800 amps, you cannot round up anymore. Now, in order to round up, there are things that you have to follow. So make sure you read 240.4b. There's a one, two, and three, and all three of those conditions must be met. All right, so let's look a little bit at the drawings of a circuit and how it all works. Because a lot of apprentices don't really conceptualize a whole circuit actually including the transformer out at the property. And that is where the circuit is completed for current to travel. So from the transformer out at the property, we'll have a panel in the middle, sure, that'll all run through and then we'll have breakers and it goes out to a box. But just to like clean all of that up and not even talk about it, let's look at this conceptually. So we essentially just have a hot coming into a box and we have a neutral coming into a box, right? So nothing's gonna cause a breaker to trip. There's nothing touching anything that it's not supposed to touch. But let's say that we have a short circuit. So the white and the black touch each other. What's gonna happen is the breaker's going to open because there's gonna be so much current flowing in this loop that it's gonna cause more current to flow through the breaker than that breaker is designed to handle. So the breaker should trip at about 200% or more. There could be way more current than that. Um, but it will trip because so much current is flowing through, right? That's how breakers trip, is a lot of current. So we're intentionally designing a device, a breaker to trip, to remove something when there's a whole bunch of current flowing through it. So that's a short circuit, right? It's a shortcut. There's no load in between there to slow that current or minimize that current. But it has nothing to do with the ground. If you notice, the ground doesn't even go to the transformer. The grounds are usually just tapped to the neutral somewhere in the system. And so when we have a ground fault, 
what's happening is we've got this black conductor that somehow touches this metal box, which completes the circuit to the ground, which the grounding jumper or bonding jumper is touching the box also. So that's how we get current to go through this neutral. We've got the complete loop from our hot, through the box, through the green conductor, the ground, and back to neutral. And so the rest of the point from that place at the service disconnect where the neutrals and the grounds bond together, from the rest of the circuit back to the transformer, it's traveling on the white, and that's how it gets its complete circuit. That's how ground faults actually trip. Now we do have ground fault breakers that have a little bit more, you know, a little uh, board inside of them, and there's more going on with something like that. But a ground fault breaker is just essentially, there's an added level of protection that we want to give people if they're like standing in water or something. We don't want a massive amount of current to to have to flow through for a ground fault to trip a breaker. We wanna have it a little bit more sensitive. So a normal breaker with a ground fault will trip like this, but a ground fault breaker is designed to sense really tiny imbalances in a circuit. So it doesn't even get to the point where there's this much current flowing through it. But that's a ground fault. It's pretty much still just a short circuit. It's just anything metal everywhere is all connected together. So if at any point, any energized conductor touches any piece of metal, it all goes back to that green that's bonded at the service, goes out to the white, completes a circuit so that enough current will flow through that breaker to trip it. Now let's look at an arc fault. We've got a series arc fault. So a series arc fault, same kind of thing is gonna happen except the fault's not over here. The fault is actually in, uh, in series in a conductor. So this could be like one screw here and another screw here. And there's just a loose termination and it's not really touching, but it's like really, really close. And there is enough of a connection to arc between the two points. That's a series fault. So arc fault breakers, again, they have a little board inside of them with a whole bunch of parameters. And it says the signatures of a series arc should look like this and behave like this. So when you sense this kind of an activity, trip the breaker. It's logic that's controlling it. The breaker part works, so if there's still a problem in the circuit and there's still a short circuit or a thermal trip or a magnetic trip, it's still going to trip, but it also has the added benefit of the knowledge to know what the characteristics of a series arc look like. And so if an arc were to occur in between these two points, it would open that breaker. Now that's a series, a parallel arc fault is the same thing, it's just between two parallel conductors. So it's not in series where you might have a conductor in a device that goes to a load and goes and completes its circuit. This is between two parallel points in a circuit. So this could be before the load, but if there's any kind of arcing that happens between like a hot and a neutral, that's what the breaker does as well. So that breaker can detect series arcs and parallel arcs. That's why we have combination arc fault devices. Combination doesn't mean ground faults and, and arc faults. It means both types of arc faults, both series and parallel arcs. So it will do the same thing. It'll figure out what, what a parallel arc signature looks like or feels like or is experienced in this electronic circuit and it'll open the circuit. By the way, don't do this at home. I'm a master electrician. I have a test environment. I know what I'm doing. Don't do this at home. All right, so what we've got here is a 220 circuit. We got a neutral and a ground. So in a normal situation, we're gonna have a load and we're gonna have wires that go to a load. So how circuits work is by energizing a load. As you can see right here, when we have a resistance in the way or an impedance, the load turns on. No problems, no short circuits. But if we take the load out of the equation and we touch these together, that's a short circuit. We just gave it a short cut. So that's 120 volt short. Now we can also have a short that is a 220 short. So we have twice as much pressure behind this short as we would with a 120. Twice as much smoke too. Now you'll notice those were with these circuit conductors that had nothing to do with the ground. So when we have a conductor that touches metal, that's specifically a ground fault. Yes, it is still a shortcut in the circuit, um, but we need to call it a ground fault. And this is what that looks like. Notice now this ground conductor, I could touch the ground conductor or I can touch the box only because this incoming ground 
is screwed in and is touching the box. So this box is bonded. So that is a ground fault and it's actually welded on. Now, the next thing we're gonna do is an arc fault. So I don't actually have any equipment to show an arc fault, but Eaton was gracious enough to allow us to use some footage from their YouTube channel where they have arc fault testing. So in an arc fault, you have an arcing occurring. So in this example, they have an arc, they have two different things that they set a certain distance away. They turn the voltage up enough to create an arc that goes across the air gap. And you can see the arc causes a breaker to trip. So you can see now, because there are different things that are happening, we need to know that as electricians. We need to know if there's a 240 short. We need to know if it's 120 volt short. We need to know if it's a ground fault because it specifically deals with something wrong with a piece of metal somewhere. And we need to know if there's an arc fault because that actually means arcing conditions, which can create fire. So it helps us identify in the circuit where the problem is. So if you're on the phone with your boss and they're like, hey, what's going on? You're just like, oh, this is a short. Well, dude, expand on that. Like use your brain, use your, your lexicon of verbiage to like actually understand what's happening because now I can help you diagnose it if you know the right language. So I hope that helped you uh, attain some more verbiage and an understanding of why it's important for these different things that we talk about. Uh, love you crazy people. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.